Hi everyone and welcome to the seventh episode in our Poetry GCSE Revision Guide. Um, if you haven't seen this channel before, what we're doing is we're going through all of the key information that you need to be successful in your exams. So for poetry, some of you this year will be doing poetry anthology like Power and Conflict or Love and Relationships. Others, others of you will not be doing that, you'll just be doing Unseen Poetry and an Unseen Comparison. So um, the way that I've set it up is basically trying to give you general poetry advice so that you can analyze your poems better, write about the poems better, whether they're a part of an anthology or something that you've never seen before. In previous weeks, we've gone through um, Bayonet Charge, which is one of the power and conflict poems and looked at structure. Mother Any Distance, which is a uh, love and relationships poem and looked at language in that. My Last Duchess, which is power and conflict again, looking at rhyme and rhythm and tone. Manhunt, which I don't think is either uh, or any of them, but I might be wrong, uh, looking at themes and motifs. Exposure, and I put myself under time pressure to create a poetry plan for that, looking at just one poem. And then Exposure and Manhunt, where I put myself in a time pressured position to create a comparative poetry plan. So today's lesson, <clears throat> we're going to be looking at a model answer of a comparative poetry essay. So um, the one that we're going to look at is actually meant to be from an anthology answer viewpoint, okay? But just because it's for the anthology doesn't mean that you can't benefit from looking at this if you're doing a comparative unseen. So whether you're doing a poetry anthology or unseen uh, comparison, today's lesson is for you. If you haven't checked out any of the weeks before I recommend that you do that if you're sitting any of this poetry um, I will say that poetry is one of the areas of GCSE in English or GCSE literature where um, students typically do the worst so this is a really good area to invest some hours in looking at my videos looking at other people's videos going through the poems just picking out random poems if you are doing unseen just randomly just literally put in random poem and just try and break down what is going on in the poem right so so anyway enough of my waffle let's go into the model answer so the model answer today would be most relevant if you're thinking about poetry anthology in the power and conflict section having said that this is exactly the kind of question that they could get you to compare two poems on even if it's an unseen poetry essay so like i said should be useful the one major difference is that in this essay, because it was done as a poetry anthology, the student has included some context. With the unseen poetry, obviously you're not expected to put any context. So the context bits in this, if you're thinking about unseen, just don't worry about that. Okay, cool. So the two poems are the prelude and uh, the other poem they chose is Ozymandia. So, so in the poetry anthology, you'll be given one poem, and you'll be given an option of a second poem. You can choose any second poem you want. In the unseen, you're given two unso unseen poems. Tough luck. Like if you don't like them, unfortunately you don't get any other options. Okay, so in The Prelude and Ozymandias, both Wordsworth and Shelley. So Wordsworth wrote The Prelude, Shelley wrote Ozymandias, Percy Shelley, not Mary Shelley, who is obviously very famous for writing Frankenstein. Uh, they're married, actually. Percy Shelley and Mary Shelley were married. Explore a decline and eventual loss of power. Both poems belong to the Romantic period and therefore share similarities in the way that poet power is presented to the reader, but also contrast in the way that decline in power is explored. OK, so obviously, if you're doing unseen poetry, you won't know when the poems were written. It might tell you on the on the on the page, on the insert, the extract, but otherwise you won't know. So you're not expected to know what period the poem was written or anything like that. If you are doing um, poetry anthology, trying to explore how poems were written in a certain context, possibly the same context like these two are, is really useful, really, really good. The subject's reaction to the realization that man is insignificant alone in the grand scheme of nature is presented entirely differently in both poems. So one of the major things at the start of any paragraph you're doing, whether it's anthology or unseen, is you want to start with setting up your point of whether it's the same sort of thing or it's different. In this case, obviously, it's very different. Yeah. So that 
that the rest of what I'm about to read, I assume is going to show the differences in the way that the poems show man's insignificance and loneliness versus nature. Now, the only thing I'd have liked to see a bit more clearly in this point is how that specifically links to a loss of power. So maybe I would like to maybe see the subject's reaction to the powerlessness and oh and insignificance of man kind versus the grand scheme of nature is presented differently. So you're just getting that word powerlessness in, which obviously links much more closely to the loss of power. Something I've mentioned either in these videos in poetry or certainly in others, like I'm doing Christmas Carol, Macbeth, Jekyll and Hyde, Lord of the Flies, all that good stuff. I've talked a lot about how you need to make it easy for the examiner, yeah? So if the poem's on powerlessness or loss of power, try to use almost that exact word rather than just saying, stuff that kind of links to it but not directly try and make it easy for the examiner to see that you know that you're talking about whatever you're talking about in this case loss of power in the prelude the boy takes the boat in an act of stealth and troubled pleasure this emphasizes the juxtapositions of emotions experienced by the boy the noun stealth implies a furtive premeditated idea that sits uncomfortably with the oxymoron troubled pleasure the adjectival troubled alongside the abstract noun, uh, pleasures, explores the confused and undermined expression of Wordsworth's interaction with nature. Obviously, that's amazing, isn't it? So breaking down the language really clearly, he's talked about juxtaposition, he's talked about oxymoron, he's then zoomed in on certain quotes. Um, really, really good. This contrasts with the words of arrogance carved into the pedestal about the now deceased and forgotten emperor Ozymandias. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Shelley's biblical allusion within this line mimics the relig religious lexicon, allowing himself to appear as a god on earth. The romantic ideal of examining the sublime, nature, society, the individual, abstract ideologies that are verging on the incomprehensible, magnificent, awesome, so what they've done here is really good, but I would say that this bit is, is not well written, just to be totally honest. Having lots of ideas and forward slashes and stuff, as I, as I said earlier, I think that it's better to um, make it easy on the examiner. So in romantic poetry, there is this idea of examining the sublime. You don't have to talk about every way that the sublime is done like they have here with nature, society, individual, blah, blah, blah. Just focus in on the one that you wanna talk about. So I think in this case, the examining of the sublime is really society's place versus nature. So you don't need all the rest of this. You just need the bits that you would talk about. So this bit seems to me to be talking about nature and society or maybe nature and the individual, at most those three things, but not all this other stuff. So that's not good. It is a model answer, but model answers can have little things wrong with them too, right? So that's, a, I think, a small issue with written expression. So anyway, it's debated in both Shelley's and Wordsworth's poems. However, the contrast comes as Wordsworth is humbled by the enormity of nature, whereas Shelley is exploding the abstract idea of power whilst introducing an argument for the permanence of art. Yeah. So it's a really good, a really good contrast. Both of them talk about how powerless mankind is compared to nature, but they are done in different ways and they're broken down really well. So that's what you want to do. You want to get clear quotes, good quotes, well-chosen quotes that you then break down the language very clearly in and explain how it proves your point at the beginning. Good paragraph. Okay, Prelude is written in blank verse. So straight away, I'm a fan of that, right? So I, the other thing, I'll just quickly write this at the bottom. The other thing you want to be trying to do across the course of an essay is you want to be trying to talk about all of the bits of art wars, okay? So you wanna talk about the meanings in the poems, you want to be talking about repeated ideas, which are also known as the themes or the motifs. You want to be talking about the tone or tones that are created in the poems. 
You want to be talking about word choices, which obviously they've done. You want to be talking about language devices, which obviously they've done already. You want to be talking about rhythm rhyme, ideally, at least a little bit, or the lack of rhythm rhyme is also just as significant. And you want to be talking about structure. And within structure, we've talked before, there's lots of things. You could talk about stanzas, you could talk about uh, sejura, you could talk about uh, line lengths, you can talk about uh, enjambamon, punctuation and punctuation also links to pace quite a bit you could talk about sentence forms and there's more to it than that but i mean that's the little other acronym i give you so i give you art wars and i also give you schleps if you don't remember this i would recommend checking out the video that i did a few weeks ago on structure um let me just see i think it was the third week uh no it was the very first video so if you haven't seen the first video on structure with bayonet charge highly recommend that that will really help you with this schleps thing but anyway the reason i bring that up is because the first paragraph is like a little intro obviously not a huge fan of intros if i'm totally honest but this one is harmless and it doesn't take long so that's fine there's no nothing in the mark scheme specifically that says you have to have an intro though if it helps you frame your ideas before you write them that's totally cool though First paragraph, main paragraph is on language, which is great. Word choices, language devices, great. So that's the W and the A of Art Wars, right? Now he's going into the fact that it's written in blank verse and Shelley uses sonnet. So he's going into structure and going into form. So let's read this. The prelude is written in blank verse. This natural free flowing exploration of Wordsworth's complex relationship with nature is conversational with the reader allowing an engagement and insight into the presumed power. And then paradoxical decline into guilt and disturbance. The Anjama one encourages through a lack of pauses, a continuity of form to occur in the ideas throughout the poem, signifying an unrelenting shift into the disturbance of feeling and the rhythmic power, uh, sorry, rhythmic movement of the boat through the still waters of the lake. So that's huge, right? That's like going through the structure, several parts of the structure and how it creates this effect. Now, the one thing that I'm trying to connect better, which again is an issue with the first paragraph, is exactly how this shows the loss of power in the poems. So my best guess is that whilst the nature moves forward constantly in this poem he doesn't as in the the poetic voice in the prelude doesn't i think that's what this is trying to talk about but let's read what he says about ozymandias as well and then maybe we can try and write a point so he is missing a point at the beginning here and that is a problem i won't lie that is a problem his ideas are great but you need to have that point at the beginning so the content of the poem can be found in the form the rolling emotions cascading and changing Shelley uses the sonnet form, which is usually assigned to a poem based on love. However, by contravening the usual structural conventions of a sonnet, he manages to emphasize the broken self-love that Ozymandias has for himself, thusly outlining the destructive nature of oppressive regimes and the seeking of adoration in a religious manner. Yeah, so these are great points about structure, but they don't really link specifically to the loss of power, right? At least on the surface. So my best way of putting a point just off the top of my head here is whilst prelude um, or, well, actually, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll talk about the authors instead. So whilst uh, Wordsworth uses structure for the uh, erratic nature of man's power versus nature Shelley uses an unconventional structure uh, form to show the lack of love and respect that the supposedly most powerful person Has lost uh, over uh, through nature and time. 
So now we have a point at the beginning that helps us to actually understand how structure is used to show powerlessness. So Wordsworth, it's the fact that mankind's power is very erratic compared to the power of nature and nature can actually shake mankind's like emotions and things like that. And in Shelley's poem, there's like this lack of respect for mankind and this idea that over time nature will destroy any power that mankind has. Okay, last couple of paragraphs. So in the prelude, once the boy has encountered the grim shape and returned from the lake, he experiences a reflective period, huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men, move slowly through the mind. The personification of the forms which move through the speaker's mind reinforce the idea that nature is a separate entity, one which is more powerful than man, and with the adverb slowly, conjures the image of a relentless barrage of pessimism, a realization of a coming of age. There is an objectification of the mind separating his body from his consciousness and therefore finding a deity in nature, a collective consciousness. This convergence of man, nature and God epitomizes the romantic movement Wordsworth promotes nature to a sentient being. Do not live like living men, highlighting the consciousness of an evolution of nature, or the consciousness of an evolution of nature. Okay, so this is a little bit unusual, but I like it overall. So they haven't started with their point, but they have explained their point as they've explained their quote. So they've talked about how effectively nature is far more powerful than a man. And over time, uh, Wordsworth comes to that realization, especially as a young man, because at the start of the poem here, he's quite a young man. He's like, I don't know exactly how old he is, but let's say like very late teens or early 20s. Um, this is okay, but as I've said to you before, make it as easy as you can on the examiner, aka me, because I don't really want to have to work to find out what your point is. I want the point at the beginning of every paragraph. So what I would then do is I would say, um, the speaker's mind reinforces the idea that nature is a separate entity more powerful than man. I would take that bit out of the middle here. I would put that at the start as part of the point. And then obviously you can analyze through the words and the choices, right? Finally, Shelley uses a violent semantic field of destruction, shattered, sunk, stamped in the past tense as he relates the tale of the symbolically decapitated dictator. Similarly to Wordsworth, Shelley separates the physical form, uh, sorry, the physical from the metaphysical the body from the mind. His use of von Jumbermond brings into focus the harsh alliteration of the cold command of the colossal wreck. The hyperbolic description of the statue only further shows how empty an abstract notion like power is and can be. So that bit there is kind of the point for this one, right? So again, we would take this at the beginning and we would make a stronger point. We would say, you know, whilst Wordsworth uses the speaker's mind to reinforce the idea that nature is a separate and more powerful entity than man. In Shelley's poem, he uses hyperbolic description of the statue to show how abstract power is within mankind versus nature. Yeah, something like that. Again, that would start the paragraph off. That would nicely explain to me as the examiner what you're going to be talking about rather than the current situation where I've had to work to understand what you're trying to say, okay? Wordsworth was an early romantic whose work was, work was largely based on nature and, and awe of nature, whereas Shelley was a later romantic known for their confrontational verse and subversive lifestyles. These two poems perfectly thematically relate to one another, whilst also showing the contextual differences within the period. Wordsworth's loss of power is in the way he interprets nature and how he recalibrates his own place on earth, where Shelley finds an impotency of power in lost archaic language and ideas in which he presides over a once powerful symbol that has become a faded memory. Beautiful conclusion. I do, again, there's no need to put a conclusion in, but I do rec recommend a conclusion if you can write something that good, because that just leaves me as the examiner with a little bit of a highlight reel of like the idea of the loss of power in the two poems. So it leaves on a really strong impression of like, okay, this student really understands how loss of power is shown in these poems. And uh, it's just a really good way of finishing off a conclusion. The other thing about this paragraph, which is gonna be more useful
for uh, people doing the poetry anthology, particularly Power and Conflict, is obviously that's really good context for Shelley and for Wordsworth. So if you're doing Power and Context, there's a little bit extra for you. That's all I've got time for today, unfortunately. So hopefully that model paragraph help, uh, model or answer helped a bit. My biggest takeaway is just to finish off strong points that answer. Oh, everything's going wrong now. Strong points that answer the question at the beginning. Detail and depth in your analysis. And also try to go through as many parts of art wars as you can. Don't just stick to words and language, try and get in some rhythm rhyme, try and get in some structure, try and think about how it links to themes, about different things in the poem and the tone. Cool. All right. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or comments, please do question slash comment down below and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.